Right, so I've got my background worker to work through my outbox and publish events, and I've got my synchronous API ready to go, but these two applications need fundamentally different things. I want my API to be reliable. I want it to be there for my users, whereas I want my outbox worker to be efficient. I don't want it to be doing work when there is no work there to be done. Oh, hello there. I'm sure you can relate to that situation. Every application you build is different, right? As you build out different services for different businesses with different requirements, every single service you work on is its own unique snowflake, isn't it? Now, that might be a nice way of thinking for you as a developer, building custom things every time. Every time you come to a new system, you get to build something new, something special. But in a lot of cases, that isn't really the case, though, is it? Hi, I'm James Easton, an advocate for Simplicity and Microsoft MVP. And in this video, with a real application, I'm going to show you that there are actually only two types of applications you will ever need to understand each with its own characteristics and considerations. Importantly, I'll also tell you why you should care. Now, this might seem a little bit reductionist, but it's a really useful way of thinking. Fundamentally, every system you build is going to be driven in two different ways. Either a user of some kind is going to interact with your system. That might be a real person, or it might be another service also interacting with your service. The point being is that the user or the service is going to take an action to call your system and then they're going to sit there and wait. They're going to wait for a response to come back. Now, maybe the service retrieves or stores some data in a database. Either way, if something is calling your system and then that something is waiting for a response to come back. Now, the second type of system you build is what I'd call a back-end service. This service isn't being triggered by a user taking an action. It isn't being triggered. There's not somebody sat there waiting for a response to come back. Back-end services are going to run on some kind of schedule or be triggered by some kind of message. Maybe you have some kind of message queue in your system. A message has hit that message queue and your background worker is subscribed to that message queue and it's going to work through and process a message. Maybe it's a little bit simpler. Maybe it's just a batch job that spins up once an hour, once a day, and actually goes and does some work. That service may then go off and send a message onto another queue. That service may interact with the database. This service, there may be a service that calls out to a synchronous system. The point being is that there's not somebody there waiting for a response. Now, an actual microservice, an actual service that you build might be made up of one or more of these components. That could be your system as a whole. Some services you build might just have a synchronous API, a CRUD API for interacting with the database. Some services you build might just have a background service only running periodically to do some work. And some services might be made up of both. As you saw in the introduction to this video, I was trying to deploy a service that had both a synchronous API endpoint, but also was working through an outbox to actually process messages and publish them to an event. So now I want you to think about all the different services you've worked on in your life. And I'll almost guarantee that every single one falls into one of those two buckets. And if it doesn't, well, please let me know what that application was, because I'd love to update my own mental model. Now you might be wondering, what's the benefit of thinking about systems in this way? Well, each of the two types of systems have their own characteristics that are more or less important. Think about your user-facing workload. Users want the application to be online all the time. If you're a user coming along here and you make a call to this API and the API is offline, it takes 10 seconds to respond, it simply just doesn't work for whatever reason, you're going to be a very sad user. And this is the case with pretty much every user-facing service I've ever built. Users always want more, users always want things to be faster, it could always be more available. Think about the recipe module inside plant-based pizza. It's the recipe module that's powering the front end. When a user hits the front end of the application, they're going to see a list of all the pizzas that are available to order. If that recipe service isn't responding quickly, if it isn't responding at all, people can't even see the pizzas to be able to actually go and place an order for the pizza. Or even if the pizzas load eventually, but it takes five, six, seven, eight seconds, they're probably going to leave and go somewhere else. And studies have actually shown that a site that loads in three seconds will see 22% fewer page views and a 50% higher bounce rate than a site that loads in one second. So your user-facing application could care about availability 
and, and latency. They are the two primary characteristics of a user-facing application. You want it to be there, you want it to be fast. What about back-end workloads then? What about our lowly little back -end? Latency and availability may well be important. The time it takes for a service to pick up a message off the queue, pull it in and process it before doing something else may be important to your service. A stock trading system that's live updating stock prices will probably have a pretty low end-to-end -end latency requirement. But in a lot of cases, when you're building these back-end services, latency availability aren't as important. The reason I say that is because you've got an element of durability built in. Typically, if you've got a back-end service that's processing from a queue, if this service is offline for whatever reason, well, these messages are just going to keep building up in this queue until the issue is fixed, and then the messages will be processed. Back-end workloads typically have a lot more flexibility in their requirements based on what the actual service is doing. Of course, you want them to be reliable to deal with failure sensibly, as I've just described them with the messages in the queue. And you want the work to be done. If this service is sat there running happily and it's not actually processing any messages, well, that's not ideal either. You also don't want a single bad message, what will be known as a poison pill message, to block up the rest of the system. So resilience, robustness, correctness, they are all important characteristics. Now, with backend services, I'd actually put efficiency as one of the most important characteristics when you're building a backend service. Because backend services are typically only required to do work when there is work there to be done. If there are no messages in the queue, if this queue is completely empty, everything's being processed, you don't really want this backend service sat there costing you money, using up resources. It's very inefficient for it to be sat there just in case something happens. That's from a cost and a sustainability perspective. Now, even after understanding that availability and latency are important for user-facing workloads, correctness, resilience, efficiency are important for backend workloads, you might still be thinking, James, why do I even care? Now, what kind of service you're building becomes important when it comes to how you actually run that service, how you actually deploy that service. If your user-facing workload needs to prioritize latency and availability, it can actually make containerization a great option for running your web workloads. Having some kind of web workload to service those synchronous user requests, whether they're coming from a user or they're coming from another service inside the system. And take that synchronous web service, run that as a container. Have the long running container that's always there to service user requests. That web workload might interact with some kind of database. It might also publish messages onto some kind of queue or topic or bus or stream, whatever that might be. And then the asynchronous workloads, those background tasks or background services, run them on some kind of functions as a service provider, whether that's AWS Lambda, whether that's Azure Functions, and have them reactive event-driven workloads reading from your queues, your messages, your buses, because these services can react automatically. They can scale up when there are messages in the queues, and they can scale down again when there is no work to be done. Back when I worked at AWS, I saw so many people trying to force fit a synchronous web workload inside AWS Lambda, jumping through all sorts of different hoops, having to do all sorts of different optimizations and provision concurrency and keeping things running. And actually, they'd probably have been better. It would probably have been simpler just to run that application on a container inside Amazon ECS. So whether you're running on Azure and you're using Azure container apps or on AWS using ECS, think about the type of workload that you're running. If latency, availability are important to you, using some kind of container orchestrator, run that application as a nice simple container, horizontally scale that across multiple cloud availability zones, you've got availability and you've got a workload that's always there waiting to run user requests. And if you've got event-driven asynchronous workloads, run them in a way that means you can only run that computer when there is work there to be done. The key thing to take away, what is the simplest possible way to run your application? It might be a container. It might be containerizing it, running it in some kind of container orchestrator and off you go. It might be functions as a service. Think back to the thing I was building right at the start of this video. I've got some kind of outbox worker, a service that needs to sit there and monitor an outbox, look for messages in the outbox and then publish them onto an event bus when there is a message there to be published. And then I've got a synchronous web workload, a synchronous API that's being exposed to my front end so that when a user comes to the plant-based pizza application, they can see a list of all the pizzas, they can place an order, they can look at their orders, 
they're two very different workloads. In that specific example, I might run the web workload, the synchronous workload on Amazon ECS or Azure Container Apps or even on Kubernetes on one of the cloud providers. But then that outbox worker, that could equally be a Lambda function running on a schedule. It could be an Azure Container App with a scaling rule defined on a service bus topic. So it automatically scales up and scales down. Whatever that might be, thinking about the type of application you are building and then thinking about what is the most efficient optimal and simple way to run it will get you a long way to building systems that are simpler and evolvable and meet the requirements that your users have. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all in the next video.